sisters and young people and friends, we're going to just review the process of judgment here at the start. <clears throat> this is the process of judgment as it's set out in Scripture. Now, I'm not going to say to you anything I can't prove. The one thing I've learned is that you can make statements and you can offer opinions. Opinions are not worth very much, are they? You don't want to hear my opinion, do you? Well, if you do, you're nuts. All right? What you want to hear from me is what you should hear from everyone who stands behind this podium. You want to hear Scripture. If it's not in Scripture and you can't prove it in Scripture, then don't listen to it. All right? So if I'm going to make a statement... I'm not going to make it without having proof, and I'll give you the proof where I can in the time available. If I can't do that, come and see me privately. So the first thing that's going to happen is that the angels, as we saw in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, will raise the dead and transport them to Sinai. They will then come to collect us, the responsible living, and transport us to Sinai. As we said uh, that's what verses 16 and 17 are about in 1 Thessalonians 4. The angels are then going to interview each responsible person. Now, we'll come to have a really good look at Romans 14 in due course. We may do that today, may do it tomorrow morning, we'll see. The angels will then bring the contemporary groups, that is... In other words, the angels will interview... You know who's going to be interviewed first in this process? You know who's going to actually appear before Christ first in this process? You and me. How do we know that? Have a look at Matthew chapter 20. There's not one thing about the future that's not revealed in some way in the scripture. And Matthew 20, the parable of the labourers in the vineyard is very, very helpful. There's no doubt about the context of it because Christ talks in the, at the end of Matthew 19 about the reward given to, that will be given to his apostles, 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes. And right at the end of Matthew 19, he uses the phraseology that concludes the following parable. Verse 30 of chapter 19 says, But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. That's the words of verse 16 of chapter 20. So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few chosen. He's clearly talking about the judgment process, isn't he? Well, this parable about the labourers in the vineyard, you know the, you know the parable, I don't need to tell you much about it. The owner of the vineyard goes out early morning. And he agrees with the labourers for a penny a day. You know how that represents? That's Israel, living under law. When they came to Sinai, they said, All that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. They agreed. There was a covenant made. They agreed, as it were, to a penny a day. But later on in the day, the owner goes out and he finds men lounging around in the market. He says, What are you doing here? Well, no man's come to hire us. He said, Right, come to my vineyard. And whatever is right, I'll give it to you. Now, let me. anybody in this hall would take on a job not knowing what they're going to get paid? Anyone? Take on a job, not know what you're going to get paid. You know, I used to be a human resources manager. I used to hire people. And one of the first questions, when I'd done my bit, I asked them, have you got any questions? Usually the first question was, what are you going to pay me? What's my wages? Well, that's why you work, isn't it? But this is on the basis of faith. Whatever is right, I'll give it to you. This is about you and me, brothers and sisters. This is about the introduction of the Gentiles who would come not on the basis of law, but on the basis of faith. So who ends up coming before the owner of the vineyard to get the reward of the day's labour or portion of the day? Some come at five o'clock and, and he has this a size at six o'clock. They only work an hour. Well, you know who comes first, don't you? Those who came last into the vineyard are the first to make their appearance before the owner of the vineyard. It's telling you something. You and I, the last Christadelphians, are going to make our appearance before Christ and he, as we're going to see, will wave us to right or left according as our work shall be and we will know our destiny before he works right back to Adam. And Adam is going to be the last one. Wouldn't that be fascinating? You've got a, got a multitude on the right and a multitude on the left. And the last one to come before Christ will be Adam. I think he's going to the right myself, but we'll have to wait and see. Have to wait and see. He's brought a lot of problems along, hasn't he, Adam? But like all men, if you repent and do the right thing, it doesn't matter about the past. You can be in the kingdom. So, 
That's a bit of an aside. But you get the idea of that? There's proof, there's inherent proof in that as to the process of judgment. You work right back to Adam, starting with us. So how do we get to this judgment seat anyway? Catch a 777 Boeing jet from Dallas, Fort Worth? No. Forget it. You're not going to get a free trip on an aeroplane. How do we know that, brothers and sisters? Well, it's all happened before. That's why. In Acts chapter 8, you know the record? Go to Acts chapter 8 and have a look because the word that is used here, harpezo, is the word that Paul uses in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 when he says we, we caught away together. Remember that? Rendered caught up in the AV. Caught away. To, this is the word that's used here in Acts chapter 8. Now we know what happens in this chapter. We've got the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And in Acts 8 verse 39 we read, And when they were come up out of the water, so he's just baptised the eunuch, the Spirit of the Lord caught away. There's our word. Harpezo. 1 Thessalonians 4.17. So it's happened. It's happened already. Philip is caught away. And the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus. Now Azotus is Ashdod. All right. So what happens here is he's down in the Negev somewhere. He's gone down here in the Negev. All right. He's baptised the eunuch somewhere down here. And the next thing, he's deposited at Ashdod. Now, if you ask Philip, hang on, what did you see as you passed over? Well, I didn't see him there. What are you seeing now? Well, this is Ashdod. It's 25 miles away. Approximately 25 miles away from where he baptised the eunuch. So there's an example of mortal transfer when God wants to take people somewhere. All right? That happened. That happened to Philip. But it's not the only thing. Consider Enoch and Elijah. They were translated, weren't they? Taken away by divine intervention. What about the disciples? Let's, you come to John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 16, when the Lord has fed the 5,000, we read this. He, he sends his disciples away. Verse 16. When even was now come, his disciples went down under the sea and entered into a ship, into the ship, and went over the sea toward Capernaum, the city of comfort. And it was now dark. Yeah, well think about this brothers and sisters, where are you and I right now? Well, we're on a sea of nations, that's what Galilee's called, Isaiah 9 verse 1, Galilee of the nations, and I think it's pretty stormy on this sea of nations in which we find ourselves, and where are we? We're in the ecclesial ship, you better off stay in the ship actually, alright, and it's being buffeted, read on, handed into a ship, went over the sea, and it was dark, and Jesus was not come to them, and he hasn't come to us either. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So that when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh to the ship, and they were afraid. He says, don't be afraid. It's me. And they willingly received him into the ship. What does it say? And immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Now where were they going? Well, they're going where you and I are going. To the city of comfort. The day is going to come very soon when we who are being buffeted in the ecclesial ship on the sea of nations are going to have our Lord Jesus Christ arrive and we're going to be very shortly thereafter in a city of comfort. Need I say more? But think about this. Think about what happened. Well, they got a boat that can carry 13 men that's out somewhere in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and there's a violent storm. Now we were there about three weeks ago and the wind was blowing from the west and we were on the eastern side at Ein Gev and we're up on the shore and there's waves coming in this high and they reckon, oh, that's piddling, that's nothing. They can be 10 feet high and higher. The waves on the Sea of Galilee in a storm. So here you've got a boat out in the middle of this lake with 13, well, 12 men at this stage but capable of carrying 13 men, so it's probably 20, 25 feet long. And it says that when the Lord comes into it, immediately they're at the place where, they go, where they're going. So they end up at Capernaum immediately. Now how do you pick up a wooden boat and 12 men and plonk it three, four miles away? How do you do that? Well, it's the spirit travel, isn't it? Angels don't have to travel like you and me, brothers and sisters. God lives in the heaven. We, have, we don't know where he is. 
The nearest star to the Earth is four light years away, which means if you travel at the speed of 186,000 miles per second, it'll take you four years at that speed to reach it. That's the closest star. So where's God? could be a multitude of like you we don't know but the angels can be with him one moment and they can be with us at the next how well don't ask me to explain the physics i don't know but i'm looking forward to the day won't that be terrific eh and that's what's going to happen to us when the angel comes knocking on your door when it's time to go you'll have no sensation of passing over this country and that country and there's the Indian, Indonesian archipelago and there's... no you'll be here, wherever you may be at the time, one moment and the next, your feet are going to be standing before Mount Horeb just like happened to these right? that's how we're going now it's my experience that when we talk about the judgment seat we tend to get a little bit fearful of the prospect. And if, you, if you're not fearful of the judgment seat in a sense, then there's, you're not human. Because we all feel deficiency, don't we? We all have a sense of deficiency. Despite the fact that we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, we still have that sense of deficiency. That's just being human. But we shouldn't fear the judgment seat. We shouldn't have dread of the judgment seat. So when Paul talks about this in Hebrews, he says in Hebrews 12:18 about Sinai, the place where we are going, and we'll prove that a little later on. He says it's the, the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire. So it, it induced fear. There was blackness and darkness and tempest. And even Moses feared greatly, says Paul, at the sight of what he saw and the divine revelations at Sinai. But Paul goes on to say this in Hebrews 12, verse 28 and 20. 29. Wherefore, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us, and as it should be rendered, hold fast to grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So there's nothing wrong with a sense of godly fear and reverence. But there is something very wrong with a sense of dread and torment. But he reminds us, doesn't he, that we're not playing around with with a God that is not just. He's just. He will not forgive those who are guilty in the sense that they are determined to go their own way. He says our God is a consuming fire. So there's a need to have a healthy reverence and respect for him. But John goes on to explain this. In 1 John 4, 17 18, he says, Herein is our love, our agape, our sacrificial love, made perfect. That we may have boldness, and the word in the Greek means frankness of speech, in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And what he means by that is that if we are trying to be like Christ in this world, we have no reason to fear. He says there is no fear, and that word in the Greek means dread. There is no dread. The word's phobia. When we get, you know, phobos, phobia from that. There's no dread in agape love. Because if you're committed, and that's what it means, sacrifice of self, if you're committed to the truth and to the service of God and others, and you've got that in maturity, at least it's grown to a stage of maturity, this is your way of life, that's what he means, that kind of commitment, that kind of complete agape casts out dread. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So put in simple terms, brothers and sisters, and especially young people who are starting out, you can't be perfect in your service. It's just not possible. You can try, though. You can set your course in life. You can make sure that you're, you're heading in that narrow path towards the kingdom. You can dispense with the world. You can get into a state where your life has direction. If that's the case and you're committing yourself to the truth and that means self-sacrifice on a regular basis, you have no reason to dread the judgment seat. None at all. You might fail and stumble, like we all do, but you can seek forgiveness, providing your direction. is That's what John's talking about. I want you to come with me now, brothers and sisters, and see the proofs as to why the judgment seat will be at Sinai. Come, come, come back with me to Deuteronomy 33. 
Now these are the three passages that Brother Thomas uses in Eureka. He starts in, in, the, in the area of the Song of Moses and then the Blessing of Moses in Deuteronomy 33 upon the tribes of Israel. So let's read verse 1. Deuteronomy 33. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. It's very important to understand who he's talking about here. He's blessing the children of Israel before his death. And he said, Yahweh came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Okay, now let's, we're going to read this carefully. Who's the them here, do you think? Well, well, we'll come to that. And he said, Yahweh came from Sinai. Now, Brother Thomas translates it, Yahweh came in from Sinai. Well, came in to where? Well, where Israel were going. Into the land of promise, isn't it? They were going into the land. So Yahweh came into the land from Sinai. He rose up, and the language is used of the rising of the sun, because Christ is going to come from the east, the direction from which the sun rises. You go out to the east and cross the Jordan with the saints. From Seir, so he goes out through the land of Edom, unto them. So who's the them? Well, the them are the children of Israel of verse 1. Christ and the saints are coming from Sinai for the redemption of Israel. For the cleansing of the land of Israel. That's why they're coming. It goes on to say, He shined forth from Mount Paran, came with ten thousands of saints. This word came, athar in the Hebrew, means to arrive, to appear speedily or suddenly and unexpectedly. And it certainly will be unexpectedly to the bulk of mankind. And with thousands, this word rebarba means a myriad. It refers to the innumerable multitude of the redeemed that will be with Christ in that day. As a result of the resurrection, the judgment and their glorification at the place of judgment. And from his right hand, it says, went a fiery law, eshdath in the Hebrew, a fire law. Fire is a symbol in the word of God for judgment. So Brother Thomas renders it a fiery mandate and Rotherham translates it fire to guide them. So why are these people in this community? They've clearly come, they've started their journey from Sinai. Why are they in this band of redeemed? Well the next verse, verse 3 explains. Verse 3 of Deuteronomy 33 says Yea, he loved the tribes as that should be rendered. He loved the tribes. He's coming to redeem Israel. And all his saints are in thy hand. You see, from his right hand, the hand of divine authority is a fiery law. All his saints, the saints are going to dispense those judgments upon the nations. It says this, all, all his saints are in thy hand. Now why are they in his hand? Well, we're told. And they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words or as Rotherham puts it each one bear away some of thy words these are the product of the word of God these are people with the kind of faith that only the word of God can produce and maintain they sat down they were Bible students these were people committed to the reading and meditation and rumination upon the word of God. And that's why they're in his hand. Alright? Very, very important passage for you and me because we're in that. We hope to be in that. So come to Psalm 68 then. This is the second passage which Brother Thomas uses. Now Psalm 68 was written by David at the time that he took the Ark to Zion. It's an Armageddon psalm. It actually sets out the whole program of divine judgment and those involved in it. And it starts curiously, really curiously, because it's actually starting with a quotation in verse 1. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him flee before him. Now this word God here is Elohim. Elohim means mighty ones. 
And this is a quotation from Numbers chapter 10, verses 33 to 36. So maybe it would be helpful to have your hand or something in Psalm 68 and have a look at Numbers chapter 10. Because Numbers 10 is about the time when Israel left Sinai on the 20th day of the second month of the second year out of Egypt. They left Sinai. And we're told something very important about this departure from Sinai. The tabernacle had gone up on the first day of the first month of the second year. So it's been up now for 50 days. The Ark of the Covenant's there. But now they've got to travel with it. So what happens to this Ark? Well, we're told. Numbers 10 verse 33. And they departed from the Mount of Yahweh three days' journey. And the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh went before them in the three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. Now that's interesting, because you see, we are actually told in the very same chapter, Numbers 10, that normally when Israel travelled, the Ark of the Covenant didn't go in front of them at all. It went in the middle. You read that in Numbers chapter 10, verse 21. And the Kohathites set forward bearing the sanctuary, and the other did set up the tabernacle against they came. So they had the Ark of the Covenant, the Kohathites, okay? So where do they come? Well, they come after Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Gershon, Merari, and Reuben, and Simeon. All those tribes go before them. So the Ark, normally, for the next 40 years, is carried, or well, next 38 years, is carried in the middle of the camp of Israel, but not for the first three days. What do you reckon that means? Well, I think there was someone who went three days' journey before us, wasn't there? He lay for three days and three nights in a tomb, and then he was raised and glorified. You know what Paul calls him? The hilasterion, the mercy seat. The principal part of the Ark of the Covenant, to which, by the way, is joined by the same piece of gold, the cherubim, representing the saints in glory. And what dwells between them, above the mercy seat? The dwelling presence, the Shekinah glory of Yahweh himself. So Christ went three days in advance of us, brothers. What for? To search out a place, a resting place for us. That's why. But look what happens here. Numbers 10. And verse 35. And it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Yahweh, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. They are the words that open Psalm 68. Psalm 68 verse 1 is quoting these words, but there's a difference. Isn't there? Here you read Yahweh. Numbers 10, it's Yahweh. Yahweh means... He who will become. But in Psalm 68, it's Elohim. Elohim means mighty ones. You see, David has this picture of the fulfillment of everything portrayed that happened when Israel left Sinai. So where was this ark going? Well, it was going to the land. It was going to Zion. And that's where David put it. After 20 years... Ignored at Kirjath Jerim, he took the ark up and put it in a tent of his own making in Zion. Alright? That's where it was designed to end up, brothers and sisters, and that's where it ended up. And all of that is typical of what's going to happen to the saints. We will begin our immortal journey to the land, to Zion, from Sinai, just like the ark did. It was constructed from materials taken out of Egypt, like you and I. It was taken to Sinai, constructed over a period of 12 months. We'll go into that because that's all about the judgment seat process. So let's come back to Psalm 68. Verse 2 says, As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, the judgments of God, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens. Wrong. The KJV translators got that wrong. The word in the Hebrew rendered heavens there is not heavens. It's Arabah. And Arabah means plain, a desert. Literally it means through the desert. So Rotherham translates it that rideth 
through the waste plains. This is about Christ and the saints travelling through the Sinai Desert. Yeah, just done that three and a half weeks ago. Alright? I know what it's like. Pretty rough place. Riding through the deserts. Immortal company. Heading towards where? Well, we're told in this chapter where they're heading. And we're told that in verse 17. Because it says this. In Psalm 68, verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000. Even thousands of angels. That word in the Hebrew means changed ones. As one alternate translation says. It's the idea of that word. Changed ones. Yeah, they've been changed. Well, where have they been changed? Well, it tells you. Now, in the King James Version, it says, The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. And the, and the translators have really wrestled with that. This is how it ought to be rendered. Ginsburg says, It should be rendered, The Lord hath come from Sinai into the sanctuary. The Companion Bible says, Yahweh among them hath come from Sinai into his sanctuary. The Jerusalem Bible says, The Lord has left Sinai for his sanctuary. That's obviously pretty close to what it should be rendered. So what's that telling you? It's telling us that the saints begin their journey to the land from Sinai, like the ark did. And because David wrote this psalm when he put the ark in Zion, completed its journey... So they end up in Zion. That's where we're going. All right. So the ark is typical of Christ and the saints coming from the place of judgment where the ark was prepared with materials from Egypt, all right, put up in all its beauty on the first day of the first month of the second year and the glory of Yahweh dwelling between the cherubim starts its journey all right, and ends up in Zion. Nobody's going to tell me that the judgment seat's not at Sinai. Sorry. And that's not the only proof. It's palpably obvious, isn't it? If you're honest with yourself. It's pal- and we've got all sorts of queer ideas about that. But the scripture is plain. It's plain as the nose on my face and it sticks out quite a bit. So what about this path taken by Yahweh Sabaoth as seen by Moses, David and Habakkuk and we'll come to Habakkuk shortly well, from Sinai yep, but there's a diversion we're going to have a look at Habakkuk, there's a diversion he has to first go to deal with the Arabs in the Sinaitic region then he has to go and smite and heal Egypt begin that process at least he probably leaves Joseph behind there you know, Joseph. 13 months after Israel left Egypt Numbers 10 verse 11 tells us that the ark and the tabernacle were constructed from materials brought out of Egypt and the process leading to the manifestation of the glory of God in the tabernacle, which occurs in Exodus 40, 34, verse 34, took a little under 12 months to complete. It's a, it's a key thing, isn't it? It's telling us that we can come to a conclusion that from the time the responsible are gathered from the nations, like Israel was taken out of Egypt, left on the 15th day of the first month after the Passover, to the time when the tabernacle went up and the, and the whole thing was complete and the glory of Yahweh dwelt between the cherubim, that time period was about 12 months. So that's how long it's going to take for Christ to go through the process of judgment. I want you to come to Matthew 25. Matthew 25 is a picture. I'm going to spend some more time on this tomorrow morning, God willing, and explain the context in which this occurs. I just want to create a picture because this is what this is about. It's about the judgment seat of Christ. It's not, by the way, primarily about the judgment of the nations. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. When you come to Matthew 25, verse 31, we read, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. Any throne, of course, that Christ sits upon as a throne of glory. And this is his judgment throne. And before him shall be gathered all nations, all representatives of all, just like the language of Zechariah 14. When we read in Zechariah 14, verse 2, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. We don't conceive in our mind that that means every person of every nation. It means representatives of the nations, and so it will be. 
at the judgment seat of Christ. And the disciples, of course, when Christ spoke these words, had no concept of, that the gospel would go to the Gentiles. He's telling them that it would. And there would be responsible people, many of them, that would make their appearance at the judgment seat of Christ. And it says he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And tomorrow morning, God willing, we're going to go into why sheep and goats are selected to represent the accepted and the rejected. And we're going to see how important those two animals are in that context. Goats, of course, it says we separate the sheep from the goats, suggests that the goats are more numerous than the sheep. And that accords with Matthew 20, doesn't it? Many are called and few are chosen, because actually we choose ourselves. At the end of the day, we choose ourselves. We're either a sheep or we're a goat, but more of that later on. This is what we're going to learn. These two animals are quite diverse, and they represent the two classes of the judgment seat. Sheep are dependent, goats are independent. Sheep are submissive, goats are rebellious. Sheep are willing, goats are callous. Sheep are obedient to the voice of the shepherd, goats don't care, they're disobedient. Sheep are gregarious, they love to be with their fellow sheep. Goats want to be solitary. Sheep were white in the Middle East, goats were normally black. Sheep only eat what the shepherd leads them to, goats will eat anything. But more about that tomorrow. That's just sort of preparing you if you're going to be here. But the reward comes, doesn't it? While those on the left are watching, those on the right are glorified. He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king shall say to them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, and they will be glorified together. So what's the process? That's what I want to talk about, the process. Well, the process is this. The angels are deeply involved. Did you see there Matthew 25, 31? When the Son of Man, that's the title of Christ as a judge, shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. Why are the angels so deeply involved in the process of judgment? We want to explain that. We are told this in places like Matthew 16, 27, 25, 31, Mark 8, 38. We are also told that the results of the judgment are to be declared in their presence in places like Luke 12 and Revelation 3. We are also told in the parable of Matthew 13 that they will remove and punish the rejected. So why? Why do they have that role? Well, they have it for this reason. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14, Paul tells us the role that they play in our lives today. He says of the angels... Are they not all ministering spirits? Now that word is liturgikos. They get the word litur liturgy from it. It actually means public service, especially in the temple. Now I used to be a public servant. I used to get paid for doing virtually nothing. All right? That's not what a public servant should be. A public servant is someone who serves the public. And the angels are, as it were, public servants to serve those who are heirs of salvation. That means you and me. We have a covenant relationship with our God. That means you and me. So, when you're baptised, and maybe a fraction before, but certainly, when you're baptised, Christ says to one of the angels that's before him, I know that you looked after Adam, and you, then you looked after Abraham, and then you looked after David, and you've had many others along the way, and you kept the records of their life, now you've got this newly baptised young person, or old person for that matter, doesn't matter. An angel is given the task of looking after you as best he can. Now he can't force you to do anything. He can manipulate circumstances, you can do a whole range of things. He can't force you to do anything against your will. Alright? Sent forth, it says. That word's apostello. They're like apostles. Equipped and dispatched on a mission to minister. The words in the Greek are ace diaconia, with a view to service for them who shall be heirs of salvation. And that's why they're going to be deeply involved. They have a deep interest in your future. And more than that, brothers and sisters, they actually make up the record of your life, which they are going to use at the interview at the judgment seat. So when you turn up there, you're going to be interviewed in due course. And the angel, the angel is going to sit you down. And he's going to open a record. Now, I believe it's a literal record. Others don't think it is. It doesn't matter. There's a record. 
going to open a record. He's going to work through that record with each of us. That is the angel that's responsible for us. How do we know that? Come to Romans chapter 14. Romans 14. Now we know what the context of this chapter is about. It's about brethren judging brethren over issues that don't matter at the end of the day. There are some issues that do matter, but these are issues that don't matter. Holy days and what you ate, all sorts of things. So Paul says to them in Romans 14 verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now there are some texts that say that that word Christ should actually be rendered God because it's the Greek word theos. Now I've had people come to me and say, but, oh, but the text that the KJV translated, that's not the best text. You've got to use this other text and that says Christos. Well, I want to show you what the Bible says about it. All right, That's the only thing that counts. Context determines every single time. So read with me. Read with me what follows. Verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord. Now the Lord here is actually Yahweh. And the proof of that lies in what's quoted, because he's quoting from Isaiah 45 and verse 23, where it is Yahweh. All right? So, as I live, saith Lord, meaning Yahweh, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Now what is he meaning? Why doesn't he say every tongue shall confess to Christ? Well, you see, this is the judgment seat of Christ, but Paul doesn't call it that here. In verse 10, he calls it the judgment seat of God. Why? We'll read on. Verse 12. So then, he says in verse 12, because this word confess that he uses here in verse 11, as you can see, means to speak out and confess fully, Every tongue shall speak out and confess fully to God, all right? So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That's why I believe it should be rendered God in verse 10. I think the text that says Theos is correct. Because it's not about being interviewed by Christ. Oh yeah, it's the judgment seat of Christ, but we're not going to be interviewed by Christ himself. We're going to be interviewed by the angel that's kept the record of our life. The one that was appointed at our baptism. And you're going to have to talk, brothers and sisters. Because it says here, confess, fully confess. And the word used here, give account of himself, is logos. It means the word spoken as an expression of the thoughts of the mind, an account or an exposition. That's what's going to happen. I'm going to give an exposition. Now, let's just talk about this for a while. <coughs> Calculate the time if Christ interviews each responsible person individually. Let's just say for argument's sake there are 20 million responsible. There's probably too few by far. Given one minute per interview, which is ridiculous, it would take 38 years working a 24-hour day, seven days a week. Well, let's reduce the number. Let's go down to 10 million responsible and Christ interviews each one for one hour. That's probably not long enough either. It would take him 1,142 years working a 24-hour day. So he's not going to do the interviews. All right. All that Christ is going to do is give a one-line answer. When people who have been interviewed are brought in contemporary groups, all the Texans, for example, from the last 20 or 30 years, the people you know, what would be the point of me going before the judgment seat with Abraham? He doesn't know me from a bar of soap, does he? And if I'm rejected, well, who cares? I mean, Abraham would be disappointed maybe, but he doesn't know me. But you know me, and my brethren at home certainly know me. So if I turn up in your presence and I'm rejected, that's very embarrassing. All right? Extremely embarrassing. That's the point of it. We'll go in contemporary groups. All Christ is going to do is wave to the right and wave to the left. He'll smile, maybe, or he might frown. Smile with the wave to the right, 
frown with the wave to the left. But some people will say, but Lord, Lord, didn't you preach in our streets? And didn't we do this and do that? And he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. One line answer. That's all they get. It's the only thing he says in the whole process. What will the angels use? Well, they're described for us in the scripture. They will use what's called a book of the life. It's an individual account of our daily lives. Now, it doesn't contain things like you clean, you, you brush your teeth before you went to bed. Right. That you had breakfast in the morning. Got nothing to do. That's not of any interest to the angelic recorder. All that the angel's interested in is the decisions you made, the things that you did that indicate the direction and course of your life. That's all he's interested in. Want to know what goes on in the engine room of your life? What's driving you? Ambition in this world? Gaining the things of this world? Or direction towards the kingdom? What's driving you? What you do each day that determines your direction goes into the record. And sins go into that record as well. But they're blotted out if, you, if you're forgiven later on. And there's another book, a single book. It's called the Book of Life. This doesn't have information about what people do daily. It only has their names. And the name is written in when they're baptised. It can be erased before they die. It happened to Israel. Two years in the truth, gone. And it's usually determined at death as to whether or not it remains or stays there. How do we know this is true? Well, David believed it. Psalm 56 verse 8, Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? And the word in the Hebrew means a writing or a record. The word tellus, kafar, means to score with a mark. A tally or a record. David believed there was a book being written by an angel about him every day. How do we know it's done daily? Well, from Malachi 3 verse 16. Then they that feared Yahweh spake often one to another, and Yahweh hearkened and heard it. And the book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Yahweh and that thought upon his name. You know, the fact that you made a decision to turn up to hear the word of God today, yeah, that delights our God, and it goes in the record. Yeah? Because you've come amongst those who fear Yahweh. You love to hear the word of God and hearken to his voice. So a record is made. Uh, a memento is the Hebrew word zikran, to mark, to remember. Okay? So why are these people remember? Well, it's written down because they feared Yahweh and thought upon his name. It's a very interesting Hebrew word. Chashap, it means to plat to weave, to compute by mental effort. You know what that means for you practically, for you and me, in a practical way, brothers and sisters? That when you open the word of God privately, when you do it in the company of others of like precious faith, when you come amongst the brethren, when you go to a Bible school and you delight in the word of God and you realise what it means in your life, what that means is that you make a decision that you're going to have to do something about the way of life. You're going to weave and plait. You're thinking about how you can manifest God in your life and how you can change for the better. When you do that, the angel records that. When he goes back to the presence of the Father, when you're asleep, he's no longer needed, he's gone back to the... That's what we read in Matthew 18, verse 10. The angels of God always looking at the face of the Father. Well, they're not. They're only there when they're not needed down here. And they're needed down here, they're with you and me. At the end of the day, when you're sleeping, they write up the record. They don't need to sleep. That's what they're doing. And let's hope what goes in that book is because we are thinking upon how we can in include, involve, weave into our lives the ways of our God and the character of our God. So how do we know that's all true? Well, because it's all going to happen again. At the end of the millennium, we read this in Revelation 20 verse 12. Thousand years Christ has been reigning and there's a final resurrection and a final judgment. We read this. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. 
And the books were open. Notice it's plural. Books. And another book was open. This is a single book, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Yes, it's these individual records that are going to be used. So who do you think is going to open these books at the end of the thousand years? Well, those who recorded them. Who do you think that might be? Well, you and me, if we're there, as kings and priests, because we will have someone, many, to look after during the kingdom age, just like the angels are appointed to look after us. We will have people. And the last thing we will do each day when they've gone to bed is write up the record. And when the time comes for the second resurrection and judgment, like the angels, we are going to interview the people who lived out their lives in the kingdom age. Same process, all over again. So when you go to bed tonight, brothers and sisters, think about that. When you close your eyes, the angel is going to be writing about you. And what he's going to be writing is what's driven you. What's your interests? What's in the engine room? Tomorrow morning, God willing, we're going to talk about those issues. So what's not found in the book? Let's, let's wrap this up. What's not found in the books at the time of interview? Well, we're told in Isaiah 43:25, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. In Proverbs 28, 13, 14, we read, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall, it's not maybe, shall have mercy. Happy is the man that feareth always, but he that hardeneth his heart, thinks he can hide his sin like David tried to for nine months on two occasions, shall fall into mischief. Psalm 51 verse 9, David says, Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. In Psalm 103 verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And one of the most fascinating and intriguing things in the entire Word of God is this simple fact, brothers and sisters and young people, that the judgment seat, when David is interviewed by the angel, not one single word will be spoken to David about his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. Because the angel that recorded that sin in the record Nine months later plus, when David had confessed his sin and Yahweh forgave him, the angel erased it from the record. So when he comes to that section of David's life, there's all this blank. There's nine months of hard-heartedness, resisting, not, not going to the Father and saying, I messed up, resisting. The angel's recording it. Nine months of it. Until David is finally repentant when Nathan comes in with his parable, remember? And the angel crosses it out of the record. It's not there. But it will remain in the Bible forever and a day. Never will the record of David's sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah be erased from the word of God. It's going to be there forever and a day. But not a word at the judgment seat about it. Now think about that. You might be publicly humiliated, disfellowshipped by the ecclesia. You might have the worst name in Christadelphia. But if you repent, truly repent, it comes out of the record. The ecclesial records might go on for decades about your sin. Don't matter. The angel will not mention a word about it at the judgment seat if it's been forgiven and erased from the record. That's why you can be blameless at the judgment seat. 
1 Corinthians 1.8 Who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.14 Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent. You may be found of him in peace, in fellowship with God, without spot, and blameless. Jude 24 Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You can go to the judgment seat with nothing adverse in the record. So what remains? Well, what Nehemiah said in his prayer, remember me for good. All the good remains, that's not erased. But all the sins are, providing you have repented, forsaken them. Tomorrow morning, brothers and sisters, we'll have a look as to how we're all going to be made manifest at the judgment seat of Christ. Thank <laughs> you.